Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So this is uh, the fifth session we are having. In the last class, we covered many topics related to statics, to equilibrium, to finding support reactions. We'll complete that topic and move to bending in beams. But we discovered that we learnt many things, but they were not clear. From uh, the discussion that came out, uh, that uh, simple issues like Newton's laws, the difference between a free body diagram and a loading diagram, the importance of visualizing the deflected shape even while your interest is limited to the force response to finding reactions. And a clarity on what is known and what is unknown. Even there we have confusion. We ended the class with that example of a footing. Uh, why three column? You can have ten columns. Uh, but it must be a beam. It must be modelable as a beam, not as a slab, not like a raft. If you make a rigid foundation assumption, you are saying that for the purpose of getting your uh, base pressure, the base pressure is your reaction on the structure. The column loads are not your reaction. So if you make column loads reactions, you're mad. <laughs> I'm saying it a little harshly, but you should realize they are the knowns. They are not the unknowns. And you had no business to, to uh, prevent the movements at the column locations. Because rigid foundation says that the whole thing will go down and you will have a linear pressure distribution. So if it's symmetric, it will all just go down. If it is not symmetric, it will tilt, but it will be a straight line tilt. And you can easily estimate the pressures. Once you've got the pressures, you've got the reactions. Don't make those reactions into actions and get the column loads as your reactions. That's madness. Once you made this assumption, and it's a, not a bad assumption if your foundation is reasonably rigid, then it's become statically determinate already. It's not complicated. The reactions are known, linear pressure distribution. If you cut a section anywhere, you can find the shear force and bending moment. Crystal clear. There's no, no ambiguity. Is that point clear? Because I heard later there was still some discussion then you were saying, how is it statically determinate? It is static. To make it statically determinate, we made this convenient assumption. Nothing wrong with that. But if you want to do it more exactly, then you should appreciate that the unknown is the support reaction and potentially at every point under the beam, you have an unknown bearing pressure intensity. You can model it with springs, but then you must correctly get the spring stiffness. And depending on how many springs you put, that many unknowns you have. Right? And you can still solve it, if you know how to solve it. And then get those, and once you've got those spring forces, it becomes statically determinate again. But don't meddle with the column loads. <laughs> column loads are given. But uh, in practice, 
people have been making these blunders and more or less everything is safe except when you go to extreme cases and we took one extreme case that one column is heavily loaded other is practically not loaded then you'll get a disastrous solution but still building stand hmm? Standing buildings is no proof of good understanding of structural analysis and design. Uh, the, it shows that there is some divine support coming, <laughs> who's, uh, which is, uh, you know, in spite of our ignorance, um, things are going well. And that's no excuse. We have to... Uh, there are many things we don't know. It's fair enough. But what we know, we should know correctly. Okay. With that, we'll move on to uh, today's session. We are all very familiar with direct equilibrium. Static equilibrium in which if you take any body which is in static equilibrium, which is a state of rest or uniform motion, then every part of the body, you can separate out a part and call it a free body. You are freeing it from the system and you are just hanging it there and you are applying all the possible forces that can be applied and we are saying that the resultant force is zero that's Newton's first law or to, to uh, make it more generic the resultant moment is also zero that's all you have two vector resultant vectors for every free body then if you want to convert into scalar components you say fx, sigma fx equals 0, sigma fy equals 0, sigma fz equals 0, sigma mx equals 0, sigma my equals 0, sigma mz equals 0. And you will find that you can cut it into many free bodies. Then you will end up with Hajar equations. But you realize that all of them won't be linearly independent. We saw that. There is a way to check it. So, you will get only a certain number of linearly independent equations. Don't unnecessarily cut, cut a beam and go inside when you don't have any information about what's going on inside. If you have information, like there's an internal hinge, then you got some, you got an additional equation of condition. What is that? The bending moment. There is no moment transfer across a section. There is shear transfer, actual force transfer, no. So, you know that at the hinge location, Unless there is a concentrated moment acting, which is very unlikely, the bending moment in the beam or the frame at the hinge location, both to the left and to the right of the hinge, is zero. So let's say that location is B. We did a problem like that. We are saying now, not sigma MB equal to zero. Sigma m, any point is zero, sigma mz equals zero. We are making a stronger statement. We are not saying the sum of moments of all forces about the axis passing through B is zero. That's a generic equation. You have not gone inside. You have now taken a free body, exposed a bending moment there. The internal force has now become an external moment in the free body. And you are saying that bending moment is zero. That's a separate equation. So you should know when you are dealing with internal, what it means. Actually, uh, we are all one. The whole world is interconnected. Right? The whole world is connected. Hmm? So uh, if you have a structure here, uh, then this is resting on the ground. The ground is on the surface of the earth, where, where will you stop the connection? You go to America, it's still connected. <laughs> but it becomes too complicated. So we separate it out. We just take out the chair as a free body and we put reaction at the bottom. So the rest of the world is removed. You understand? But there are interconnections still there which we have conveniently separated. So internal, external is all in the mind. It depends on what body you have taken, what support conditions you have taken. Is it clear? We also did in the last class, we said if it's something is statically indeterminate, say indeterminacy is 1 or 2, 
you may choose to treat it as externally indeterminate, which is the normal thing everybody does because it's very easy to handle, to visualize. But you can also treat it as internally statically indeterminate. You can cut a section anywhere and treat whatever unknown internal forces you get there, bending moment, shear force, actual force, one of them, two of them, three of them, uh, and uh, do it. A little more difficult, but anything is possible. Finally, uh, we believe that there is a unique solution. Whichever way you do it, you will all get, end up with the same answer. You should. And this is guaranteed if the structure is stable and behaves in a linear elastic manner. If there is non-linearity, if there is possibility of instability, which happens in some rare cases, then there is no guarantee your solution will converge. If it is dynamic, not static, you have problems of conversion. But for our structure, simple, the very fact that you see something standing there shows that it is in a state of static equilibrium. Something is going on. <laughs> you don't know what is going on, but you can find out. That's our that's what we are discussing in the session. Now, equilibrium can be approached in alternative ways which we are not used to. We were we know sigma fx equals 0, fy and all that. But can we approach it through a concept of work, principle of virtual work? The form that we use here to, satisfy, to find an unknown force is called principle of virtual displacements. And the same principle of virtual work, when you use it to find an unknown displacement, is called the principle of virtual forces. You can also apply an energy method, the principle of stationary total potential energy or Castigliano's theorem 1, you vaguely remember all this. Or you can use its counterpart energy method here to find, uh, to establish a compatibility equation or to find an unknown displacement or to def find a stiffness coefficient. Three options you have in this approach. Similarly, three options you have in this to establish an equilibrium equation, to find a flexibility coefficient. We'll understand the meanings of these words as we go on or to find an unknown force. When I say force, I am referring to the family of forces. Remember, I gave it a, a gender also. I said they are all male. Uh, but it can be a moment or a force. They, it's all generically called force. Is this clear? So basically, we are interested in finding the response. And if you really want, we want to find the entire force field and the entire displacement field the requirement is this field is statically admissible, which means it must satisfy equilibrium, and this field is compatible, it must satisfy the compatibility conditions. I can completely ignore this and deal with this if my structure is statically determinate at a price. The price is the right brain is paralyzed. You are not visualizing the behavior, which is not a good thing. I mean, you can still visualize and not calculate any deflection. That's what I would like you to do because we are dealing with deformable structures. Rigid structures are just a myth. They don't exist. There's not a single rigid structure anywhere in the world. Everything is deformable. Okay. Please ask questions at any point. Okay. Now we we'll look at this principle. Can anyone tell me what is the principle of virtual work? It was originally proposed for rigid bodies by Bernoulli. Do you remember the principle? Anyone? A principle which we use to establish equilibrium. Instead of saying the resultant force on a body is zero, that's a condition of static equilibrium, or resultant moment is zero, we can say it in another way. What is the other way? You know it, but you are being shy. Someone, tell me, what is the other way of saying it? Anybody? Okay. So, let's say we have a body. I am showing a boulder and let's make it a rigid body to begin with. Rigid body means, what is the meaning of rigid body? 
a body which never changes shape if there are two points in that body spatially that distance will never change though the whole body can rotate and translate these two fellows will be always in the same spatial relationship vis-a-vis -vis one another is it clear which means there can be no strain the strain energy in such a body is always zero it's rigid but as a whole the the thing can move and rotate but if it's deformable then the distance between these two can change and if it's linear elastic the more load you apply proportionately the distance can change is it clear when you stretch and pull and push all real structures are deformable but uh, to work out principles maybe it's good to begin with rigid body so you have a rigid body and let's say you have externally applied forces in all possible directions i've just shown some five forces here but i put fi meaning i you can stretch to infinity and they are acting on the body on the surface now what should we do normally if we apply newton's law we will try to find the resultant force right we can do that so uh, but before that let's understand what is work what is work work is done by what force. a force very good how do you define work done by a force then i'll challenge your understanding how do you define work done by a force all the ones interesting ones who answer questions are sitting in the back should come front yes when you apply a force that cause any change in the state of the body okay yeah. all right you assume some work has been done if a force can produce a displacement in a body correct and how do you calculate that work you multiply the force by the component of the displacement in the direction of the force that's what we've learned yes or no correct now this is a funny definition do you agree or not let me tell you you uh, want to move into a new flat in the third floor and the lift is not working you have some heavy luggage to transport and uh, you get a laborer a coolie to carry this heavy weight and he goes all the way up but he finds that the door is locked because you lost your key then he comes down did he do work at or not he did work sure he sweated it out yeah yes or no you, you have no doubts he did work or not or you still have a doubt no but you say i attended a physics class the teacher told me that it is integral f dot dr dot product of force and the movement and this luggage did move uh, but uh, the, it came back to the same point so the net displacement is zero so you tell the coolie sorry the, it's very heavy but you have to multiply by zero i can only give you zero rupees will that argument work with the coolie coolie will say you are mad what where did you study <laughs> uh, so something is wrong did you ever ask your physics teacher this question let's say you go all the way to mount everest and you came back to the same spot you have done no work yes or no no work maybe you did some imaginary work virtual work <laughs> but <laughs> so it's very funny you should ask these questions huh? you will see the path of the work you see whichever path you want you come back to the same point you always come home no or you don't come home you come home no you carry a bag you go to mount everest you come back with that bag back at home and i ask you you must have done a lot of work you say no my physics teacher tells me i have done no work at all because of Huh? You lost some energy. I agree. You lost some weight. 
before you went to mount everest you weighed 75 kilos now you are only 50 kilos <laughs> right these things happen that's why you go to everest in the first place okay it's very funny you never ask this question you say sir what does it matter i want to get marks in the exam no you want to understand yes or no even more funny you go down in a train in those nowadays you have all these uh, luggage with the we, uh, you know what are they called casters where you can pull along poor coolies have lost their job so let's say he's carrying it on his head and he is walking horizontally in the platform say long platform hmm? Kharagpur has the largest railway station platform he says so one one end to the other end he walked <coughs> then he put the luggage down he is tired he said right he is an old man he said pay me according to your physics calculations did he do any work at all now it's a different question did he do any work at all? He traveled, let's say, one kilometer. Did he do any work at all? No. Because the force here is a gravitational force. Weight is a force of gravity. It's acting in the vertical direction. The fellow moved in the horizontal direction. F dot dr is zero. Yes or no? We said force times displacement in the direction of the force. Did he change did he move even one millimeter vertically but the poor fellow sweated it out and you are saying no so something is wrong with our understanding of work yes or no what is wrong say no no we should not ask such questions have you ever asked this of your teacher huh why did it ever occur to you did it ever occur to you Yes, then why you didn't ask? Oh, we should not ask. <laughs> Some people say you should never question the code. Like that, the author of this is a big book, foreign book, western author, integral left dot dr, must be right. Something must be wrong with me. What is this? Will you ever enjoy any learning with this approach? You wasted your learning. So what is the answer? So I will not give you the answer. The best way to learn is by learning by yourself if you want to learn. You have to prove to me that you wanted to learn and when we meet in the next class, many of you will tell me the answer. Is that a fair thing? Okay. We will we'll right now accept it. I will give you a clue. This is the physicist's definition of work. Maybe we should have used another word. Then there would have been no confusion. We all know what work is. When you sweat it out, you work. We should have called it quirk. <laughs> you know what quirk means? Q-U-I-R-K. It's a mystery. Anyway, so this is the definition of some quantity, mathematical quantity. It may have a correlation with the actual work. It may not have, right? So don't mix the work we understand in our lay language with the work the physicist has, okay? So this is that work. Now, when you say virtual work, there's no confusion at all. Virtual work has no confusion at all. Okay, <clears throat> so let us look at that. So the resultant force of all these, you can... Uh, write like this, right? Uh, vectorial summation, okay? It's a vectorial summation. Oh. And if this is zero, then you say the body is in static equilibrium. Yes or no? Now, Bernoulli said, using this core concept, let's do something. Let's give it an imaginary push, a small push. A virtual displacement, right? We'll just push it. So when you push it, and uh, should not, don't push it too much, little bit, small displacement, 
then each of these points of action have moved and each of them would have done some work if you multiply by the component right f dot dr and the resultant force is acting at this point let's say that also may have moved slightly now you calculate and we will simply this we, we are calling virtual work because we don't care if there's a cause effect relationship between the applied force and the movement in our structural engineering we often have a cause effect relation but here we are saying no cause effect relationship then it's a lovely definition we are saying that the actual virtual work is this summation which must be equal to this into this yes or no either i look at total virtual work here or i replace all the forces by a single force and look at the movement here to both these bodies i am applying the same displacement field so numerically this must be equal to this and if the body is in equilibrium this must be equal to zero because this quantity must be equal to zero simple argument because this quantity now you, you can't say this quantity equals zero you can't say that but this you can say for sure newton's first law fr must be zero for a body in equilibrium you multiply fr with a non zero quantity you'll still get up zero this is a dot product so this whole thing must be zero so this whole thing must be zero right so the work done is zero that's a big this simple argument of bernoulli and he said if you take a body subject to many forces a rigid body and if it is in equilibrium and if you give it an imaginary displacement and if you find the total virtual work done you could even say external virtual work but it's the same thing total work done virtual work done through this summation then that must be equal to zero for the body to be in a state of static equilibrium simple definition very useful very powerful got it now is this definition applicable to deformable bodies so people later said it actually we can do use it in structural analysis but in structural analysis we also have internal forces so uh, the net force is zero so in structural analysis we use it in a, a different way now i'll give you in my view the best understanding of this for generic applications remember this figure we showed you earlier this is a a structure a truss for convenience which is subjected to all possible i'm taking a free body i don't need supports here i'm looking here at the force field and i'm only saying this force field is in equilibrium it is a statically admissible force field got it we are not looking at we are taking a free body of the structure and we are putting hajar forces on it wherever we can now you can put forces at every joint in a truss and there are two components orthogonally in a plane truss in a space truss three components and uh hopefully this is in equilibrium which means the net force is zero for this free body right now it also has internal forces each bar has an actual force could be tensile could be compressive those forces i'm calling n normal force n i f j j possibilities are up to 14 1 to 14 n i possibilities are 1 to 11 because there are 11 members got it this is one truss now imagine a clone of the truss actually the same truss but for convenience it has got its twin a clone and to that clone i apply displacements so i'm looking at the displacement field here and i'm only assuming that the field is kinematically admissible which means it's not falling apart the all the structures are connected all the joints are connected and in this case i'm letting the supports also move if they want to move okay it's still internally integral 
So even the supports have moved. And you remember this nomenclature I discussed with you. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are called coordinates, like unit vectors. D1 is the displacement here in the horizontal direction, F1 here, F D2 here, F2 here. Got it? And this, so this system too has the displacement field consists of the joint displacements DJ 1 to 14 and the member deformations, the actual deformations, elongations, positive means elongation, positive here means tension, elongations and there are 11 elongations possible because there are only 11 members, got it? These two are related by compatibility conditions to maintain integrity. These two are related by equilibrium conditions to maintain equilibrium. Got it? This is all a geometry understanding. This is all a statics understanding. So we call this statics, we call this kinematics. Is it clear? And there need not be any cause-effect relationship. This is arbitrary, this is also arbitrary. Now the principle says this, it's a law that every structure upholds. It's a hidden law, which you can pull out from the principle of virtual work. What does the law say? Can you tell me what it says? Can anyone tell me what it says? You probably never learnt it this way, but if you learn it this way, you can handle any number of problems. What does it say? It says, and let's imagine that you have some numbers. This is 10 kilonewton, this is 12 kilonewton, this is minus 5 kilonewton. You can give any numbers here and satisfy equilibrium. Okay. What the law says is mind blowing. It says you simply multiply F1 with D1. Why? Just for fun. And there is no need to take a dot product because they are both in the same direction. If it is negative, that shows either, that means F1 and D1 are acting in two opposite directions, that is all. Otherwise, they will be positive. Multiply F1 by Dn, D1 and we are calling that a virtual work component. Multiply F2 by D2, F3 by D3, F4 by F D4, all the way F14 by D14 and add it all up and give it a name, external virtual work. Why give that name? Because these are external forces and these are jo corresponding conjugate joint displacements, external virtual work. Got it? You will get some number. It will have some units. What will be the units? Of work. What is the unit of work? Joules. To make it simple, force is kilonewton. Displacement is? meter. Of course, actually you will be putting millimeter, but he can meter. So, kilonewton meter, same as moment. Joules is a very, you know, we don't talk of joules much. Huh? Only joules. Joules we don't talk of. So, kilonewton meter. Got it? More likely it will be kilonewton millimeter because your displacements are going to be very small. Clear? You got some quantity, some actual number, it could be 53.52, let's say. Agreed? Now you add all the internal virtual work components, which means conjugate, a husband wife relationship is here, conjugate. This fellow of internal force here in your mind is married to. The deformation here. Why? Chuma. Just like that. Huh? I is a common factor. The same bar. Got it? Just multiply N1 with E1. N2 with E2. N3 with E3. In this case, N may be tension positive. In this case, E may be contraction negative. Then you should put Minus sign. Is it clear? And you will go all the way to N11, E11. You will get some number. Again, what is the unit of this? Kilonewton. Same kilonewton millimeter or whatever you like. And lo and behold, by magic, 
it will be exactly the same as the external virtual world. There's a proof for this. Hmm? That's mind blowing, isn't it? It's a hidden law. You'll never forget it. We can apply it in infinite ways. Okay. That's all there is. External virtual work, total external virtual work is equal to total internal virtual work. Sigma Fj dj is equal to sigma Niei. For a truss, it's very easy to describe. The only requirements are Fj and Ni must be statically admissible and belong to some system. And dj and ei must be kinematically admissible. See, we came to this after spending the first four lectures understanding what is kinematically admissible. Is it clear? So, uh, we've got some clarity here. You can't just arbitrarily multiply and add. But this works. It works beautifully. Got it? Some people explain this principle by putting a minus sign and putting this equal to zero. We don't do that. Why honestly put a minus sign? We use this formulation. Total external virtual work is equal to total internal virtual work. Got it? Any confusion? We can demonstrate it also. Clear? Now, if you want to find support reactions, uh, you make your life easy. You make your life easy by giving only rigid body virtual displacements. Because you have a statically admissible structure. I mean, you can pretend it's a rigid body. Which means, N, no, E, rigid body movement means no elongations are possible. E will always be zero. Then it, you can breathe a further sigh of relief and say, this whole thing is going to be zero. Because all the E's are zero, rigid body movement. Then your equation reduces for a rigid body to sigma fj dj equal to zero, which is Bernoulli's principle, original principle. Got it? No internal work. So don't waste your time there. Later we look at internal work when you want to find a bending moment inside a beam. But right now we are looking at support reaction. It's a very powerful principle and let's just demonstrate it with a few cases. Clear? According to the principle of virtual work, the total external virtual work associated with the products of external forces F external and the conjugate displacements D external. Conjugate because remember F1 D1, F2 D2. That is the conjugal relationship between the force and the displacement. Got it? No cheating there. F1, don't say F1 D3. No, that, that is also another virtual quantity but it is meaningless here. F1 D1 only. Husband with that wife only. But many couples are possible. No extramarital relationships allowed here. See how? Ain't the law of the system, uh, there's some morality in this also. Okay. And it is this total product we call D external, external virtual work. It is equal to the internal virtual work associated with the product of the internal forces F internal with the conjugate Displacement D internal. D internal for a truss we write as E. But for a frame structure you will have uh, theta, you have delta, uh, sorry, you have curvature and all that. So we look at those complicated things later. Truss is so easy, we will play with the truss first. From small things we will build up. Okay, clear? And we explain this. You can write it in matrix format like this. Okay. One of these, because these are all column vectors, F external is F1, F2, F3, F4, up to F14 as a column vector. D1, D2, D3 as a column. You can't multiply one column vector with another column. One of these guys, you'll have to make row vector. So put a transformation and then you can write it like this. Okay. Now, simple thumb rules, never forget. Number one, in this proof, System 1 and System 2 are independent. No cause-effect relation. Independent. They are clones. Same structure. Number 2. The force field in 1 must be statically admissible. The displacement field in System 2 must be kinematically admissible. We have said that. But support movements are allowed. 3. When you look at System 1, you look only at the husband's. 
don't distract your attention by looking at the wives. Normally it will happen. But don't do that because you will get confused. Pretend they are all bachelors if you like. You understand? Don't get, look only at the phone. The mistake we make is we, how is it possible? Because you are unnecessarily bringing in the correct displacement diagram. Don't look at it. Look only at the forces. When you look at the displacement in system 2, don't look at the forces. Is it clear? Only then this works. Now itself, if you remember, Betty's theorem deals with the same principle in a different way. Okay. Ignore displacement system 1 and forces, if any, in system 2. Deformations are assumed to be small in the original because if you have large deformations, the forces will change angle, direction, you know, it's not going to work. Elastic behavior is not assumed. Did we assume any elastic behavior? No. Some of the members can yield. Who cares? <laughs> that is why we can apply it, for example, in yield line theory, in slabs. You have large deformation, relatively. Yielding takes place. Plastic, remember the mechanism method in plastic analysis? It uses this th theory. It does not matter whether the systems are real or virtual. In other words, you can, let's say you have a truss and you want to find an internal force in the truss. The truss is real, the force field is real, given loads. To find that unknown force, you are now imagining a movement which is unreal and playing this game. Got it? But you may also have a situation where you have actual displacement also involved there. So you can have many combinations. Real forces, real displacements, real forces, imaginary displacements and those four combinations. Both can be imaginary but that's uh, meaningless. At least uh, the trust, the structure should be real. Okay. So this is also called the dummy displacement method when you are applying it to finding reaction. It's called. So when you say, if you want to find an unknown force, the force field is real, then to find the unknown force, you imagine a virtual displacement. So that's why you invoke the principle of virtual displacements. When the displacements are virtual, the principle of virtual work is called principle of virtual displacements. When the forces are virtual and the displacements are real, we call it the principle of virtual forces. You use the principle of virtual forces to find unknown displacements. You use the principle of virtual displacements to find unknown forces. Got the game? That's it. So, uh, you have a real force field and you want to find one unknown force. For example, a support reaction. That's a current topic. Or you may want to find a stiffness coefficient or set up a, this you put on hold for the time being. Rest now. Right now, we will only talk of finding an unknown force. Take this example. You have a truss like this. Okay. I'm just putting three forces, but you can put any number of forces you like. F1, F2, F3. And you are interested in finding the reaction at the right support. Okay. Normally, what will you do? You'll you know, close your eyes because you've been so well trained. Sigma Fx equals zero. Sigma Fy equals zero. Sigma moment about this point. Tuck, you'll get in one equation, right? Anybody can do it. We won't do that. So a good question paper, you are not allowed to invoke direct equilibrium. You have to use principle of virtual work. We'll give you a set of questions after we finish this topic for you to do. This is a course, such a lovely course, no examinations, no assignments, unless you want to do them. So I suggest we'll give you an uh, assignment sheet. You do it. Do a few problems here and there just to uh, know. And the book is there. The book is your reference. So that you know. And that gives you more confidence. Knowing the problem gives you more confidence. Okay. So what should we do? Now tell me. I want you to, it's called the beginner's mind. You know, you're a baby making the first baby steps. You've learned this powerful principle. What will you do now to find FJ? from whatever you've learnt. Tell me, don't get spoon fed. Give your own answer. What will you do? What baby step will you take? 
Yeah? You have to assume a displaced, virtual displacement. Suggest one. What should you do? Hmm? What will you do? Elongate. No elongations allowed, then you are getting into unnecessarily internal virtual work. You can give rigid body moves. Imagine you have a similar truss, and to that truss, what should you do? You want to find, see, if you move the whole thing, you have reactions here also, no? Here and here. Those fellows should not do any virtual work. Only this fellow should do any virtual work. So, you must first see where are the unknowns. These are the unknowns here. So, whatever you do, this joint should not move, first principle. And whatever you do, this joint should move vertically. Yes or no? So, how will you achieve that? Take the same truss and quietly rotate about this, right? Do that. And for small rotation, this will move vertically. Sine theta is equal to theta when theta is very small. Got it? Does it make sense? The advantage of doing, and let's say that is a dummy displacement, delta. Now, what's the principle saying? If you know this, then you must be good in geometry or trigonometry and say, I can write these movements, wherever these loads are acting, this F1, that has gone up, I must be able to write this in terms of delta. By sheer geometry, trigonometry. I must be able to write D2 in terms of delta. I must be able to write D3 in terms of delta. Got it? And then I can invoke the principle. There is no internal virtual work because it's a rigid body movement. E1, E2, E3, blah, blah, zero here. And so that's how I'll do it. Got it? So you know the trick. Identify which unknown you want and play this game accordingly. So let's begin with a simple this could be any simply supported structure. I just put a boulder there. It could be a truss, it could be a frame, who cares. Now, uh, you have a load W acting here and these are the three possible reactions, right? You can straight away say HA is zero because in your mind you're already invoking sigma fx equals zero. Let's not invoke anything. And let's say I want to find VB. This is my real force field. So I imagine a displacement field like this where A does not, this point remains there, I rotate this slightly and B has gone up here. And let me say that movement upward is delta. Now I look carefully and say HA and VA are not going to do any work. VB is going to do work and the work is VB into delta. The only other force acting here is W. I must find out in this body, this is not doing any work, in this image, how much is the movement of the line of action of W? So I can say that anywhere on this axis, the movement will be this much. Can you tell me how much that is? Similar triangles, how much is it? Delta into A by L. Anybody can do this, right? That's it. Apply the principle of virtual displacements and W is acting down, but you pushed it up. So you have to put minus. Anything up we say is positive here. So W is negative. Delta into A by L is the external work done by this W. This is zero into this is HA into zero plus VA into zero. I don't even write it there. And this VB is moved up. VB is moved up by delta. Got it? So I'm getting the answer. Del now when you write the equation like this. Delta is an arbitrary non-zero quantity. So it's not zero, so the other part must be zero. And that's how you're saying VB is WA into L, which you know is the correct answer. Simple, easy demonstration of the principle of virtual displacement. Let's do it a more complicated example. In this example, you have a simply severed beam with all kinds of funny loads, right? You have a concentrated load, 30 kN on the overhang. This is a beam with an overhang, 20 kN constant. This is statically determined, by the way, just rigid, simply supported with an overhang. And you have a distributed load, which you can integrate 10 kN meter spread over 4 meters, will be 40 kN. Its CG, its centroid will be acting at 
the middle which is 2 meters from here. You know all this, right? And the question is find the reaction at A. Find the reaction at A. What will you do? You please draw the virtual displacement field to get the reaction at A. I want to see your sketch. You just want the shape. You want only VA to do work. The unknowns HA and VD should not do work, virtual work, right? So, show me the shape. Yes. Now, let's say whatever you drew, you lifted this up. You are giving it a rigid body movement to this, lifting it up. That is delta. So, you have drawn it correctly. Some of you. Delta. Now, you have to know how much these fellows have moved. So, 30 kilo, so you can use similar triangles because this angle you know, again you assume sin theta is equal to theta because the angles are small. So, how much has 30 kilo Newton moved? Tell me. 6 divided by 8 into delta, which is 3 by 4, which is 0.75 delta. Got it? Now, this is distributed. If you want, you can integrate, but why not find out how much 40 kilo Newton has moved? Right? How much has 40 kilo Newton moved? 0.25 delta. How much has 20 kilo Newton moved? Similar triangle, also 0.25 delta. Got it? Now, just be careful of the signs and apply the principle of virtual displacement. What should you do? VA into delta positive. This is up, this is up. HA into 0, that's not moving. 30 and 0.75 in two opposite directions. So you put a minus sign. 40, whether it's concentrated or UDL, it makes no difference. You'll get the same result. 40 into 0.25, again you have to put minus because this is down, this is up. And then 20 into 0.25, positive, both in the same direction. Easy equation to solve, delta you eliminate. Just another example. Okay, so this is the power of this method. It's really powerful when you have internal hinges. So in, in mechanical engineering, it's very useful because they have all these uh, gears and uh, you know, shafts with mechanisms. They, you know, especially have multiple hinges, this is more effective, easier than the direct equilibrium method. So take a look at this. This is a propped can. This is a propped cantilever with an internal hinge, which means the presence of the hinge makes it just rigid, right? To use our parent-child analogy, CB is the child, AB is the parent. Got it? Now, what are the reactions you can get? You have VA, VB, and MA. Assume directions. The question here is: find MA and VA. Now, in this method, you can find only one unknown at a time, right, uniquely. So, let's say I want to find MA, what should I draw? Show me the displacement field if I want to find only MA. Now, it's interesting, which means whatever diagram you draw, rigid body movement, VA should not do any work and VB should not do any work. Now, let me see. So, this will really, very good, this will really test your uh, understanding. Which one are we finding? No, huh? okay, okay, MA. What about finding VA? Let's say I want to find VA first. First, I want to find VA. Okay, you've done it correct for MA. I want, so, I want to see two shapes. First, I want to find VA. Which means MA should not do work. Ah, this is a challenge. That means you have to lift this fellow up by delta. That's how, that's how we play the game. But the theta should be zero. Otherwise the rotation will do. How, how will you move it up? Here, don't worry about fixed support and all that. You just want a shape. Draw a shape. Yeah. 
Good. So, first remove the supports because we want to look only at the free body. The, if you want to look at statically admissible field, draw the free body. And uh, the beauty is you can replace on this side of the hinge all this you can integrate and write this Q into 2L by 3 and this Q into L by 3, the location you know. So this is your force field. Now you are going to imagine a virtual displacement field. This is what you should do. You can actually play this game. Now we are doing a thought experiment, you are all mature students, so you don't need a physical demonstration. You can do it in your mind. So I have made this movement. Okay. The reason why I want this parallel to this is because I don't want any theta, otherwise MA will start doing work. This I can do. When I lift this up and I want it to come back here, this is the only configuration you can have. So this is the virtual displacement field to find VA by ensuring MA is not doing work, VB. These are the two unknowns not doing work. Then I apply the principle of virtual work, very easy. And by the way, this entire thing, this entire Q in this segment is going up by delta. So the work done by this is Q into 2L by 3 into minus delta because they are all, they are opposite. And this part is going by varying delta, right? So I can take an average. So I can take this load and see how much this has gone through. And that is delta by 2. Yes or no? Very easy. One minute you can do it. Now you play the game. VA into delta positive minus this load Q into 2L by 3 into delta and minus, this is also minus, QL by 3 into delta by 2 is equal to 0. You got the answer. One shot. So you have alternate ways of checking your answer because you all, always can apply your direct equilibrium and check. Which is what you should do, you should always cross check. Got it? And some of you drew this also correctly. To find VA, MA, uh, to find MA, MA should do work. MA will do work only if you have a rotation. But I don't want VA to be doing work. And I don't want VB to be doing work. This can change angle here because that's the job of the internal hinge. Internal hinge will allow free relative rotation between the two connecting members. You are playing with it like a mechanism. Got it? And same argument, once this is, th so instead of saying delta is my unknown, I can take theta as my unknown, nothing wrong. So theta into 2L by 3 will be this movement. This will be half that movement, so theta into L by 3. And if this is theta, this must be 2 theta. Why? Because this is 2 theta by L by 3. If I divide by L by 3, I get 2 theta. So if this is theta, this must be 2. This is compatibility. This makes the system kinematically admissible. This is statically admissible. Got it? That's a requirement to apply the principle of virtual. If you mess this up, you will get a wrong answer. Now, multiply it out. MA is doing work, positive work. MA into this theta A, which is theta into L by 3. Sorry, MA into theta. And this load is moving down by theta into L by 3. And this load is moving up. So the load is down and is moving up by 2 theta L by 6. Multiply it out, you'll get the answer. Solve the equation. Clear? Powerful method. Imagine you have a structure with many internal hinges. This is the best way you can crack these problems. One or two last problems. Let's take this structure. And the question is to find the reaction here. This is a truss now. So you know what to do. This is, uh, you have to rotate it about A. And that's what we'll do. We will lift it up slightly by delta. Delta is very small. Now the challenge for you, and this is where you have to be a little good in geometry, trigonometry. You have to see how much this 30 kilo Newton has moved sideways. It's moved to the left. And how much this 40 kilo Newton has moved vertically. 
and that needs a little understanding and especially in the olden days we used to do this manually by what is called the Williot Moore diagram uh, we were good in this so let me show you how it can be done so to find out this let's draw the components if this is delta this rotation is delta divided by 3 meters it's a rigid body rotation so this is also delta by 3 right now you look at this region this I can write like this I need to find C dash D because that's how much 40 kilo Newton is moving moving I need to find C D because that's how much the 30 kilo Newton is moving so I need the relationships in that triangle got it in that triangle how do I solve it any suggestions remember there is an angle here alpha this is a what triangle is this iso isosceles triangle right and it's conveniently given good teachers always make you avoid use of calculators so it's conveniently given in such a way that this angle is in the ratio of 3 4 and so this will be 5 3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to 5 squared conveniently right okay now this angle can you bring into this triangle in this triangle which of these angles is equal to alpha then your job is done you have 3 c d c dash d c is 90 degrees but there are two other angles which of them is alpha anyone d c dash c can you argue it out how right right you can do that or you can talk of alternate angles remember alternate angles complementary angle we studied all this so if this is alpha this must be alpha let's blow it up this angle must be alpha right and if this is alpha then this must be alpha because this must be 90 minus alpha if it's a, it's a we are assuming this to be 90 degrees if this is alpha this is 90 minus alpha then this must be alpha so you are right whichever way you argue it out you know this is alpha once you know this alpha and you know that so c dash c is delta by 3 into this length so this is 3 4 5 and you know what alpha is and so you can find c c dash this length is two and a half meters because uh, this is three meters so delta by 3 into 2 and a half meters is cc dash once you know cc dash you can get these two components very easy okay i'm just showing you how it can be done somehow you have to get it okay use good trigonometry arguments and get it once you've got it child's play just invoke the principle of virtual work and uh, vb into this is equal to 40 into it it's in opposite direction so minus into delta by 2 and 30 into 2 delta by 3 opposite direction solve it you get so gave you another example one last example we'll take which is a cable you've got a cable here in which only one load is hanging in the middle let's say you're hanging your shirt in your clothesline the question is okay so the lengths are given and this angle is 30 degrees you have weight here question is what is the horizontal reaction at a and b okay so this is your real force field and by the way the resultant of these two will be in this direction you know that because that will be equal to the tension in your cable now the question is you know va and vb must be p by 2 but then you've invoked principle of your direct equilibrium you are not supposed to do that but even if you do that you don't know what h is right you can work out h by knowing that they are related by the 30 degrees but let's not do that tell me how to get h by the principle of virtual displacement this is my real <coughs> force field I must cook up I must imagine a field where this H does work you got now two H's equal and opposite 
So, what is a good thing to do? Any suggestions? Ah, tell me. What to do? Spread them apart. That's right. Spread them apart. And the cable is inextensible. So, if you take this cable and you spread them apart by delta, then this will go up. You have to figure out how much this goes up. Because that's the work that P will do. And that you can prove. I leave it to you to work it out. Just want to give you a feel. Because you have to be very good in, in the trigonometry part. You can figure it out. You can prove how much C has gone up. C, and work out the mechanics of this. And then H. This H is multiplied by delta. This H is also multiplied by delta. Or you can say the relative movement is 2 delta. Either way you will get this answer. And P has gone up by CC dash which we proved to be root 3 by 2 into delta. Delta is missing there. Delta you eliminate and you will get. This is a powerful way to solve the problem. Is it clear? With that we have covered support reactions. Uh, we have one energy method also to crack reactions. We put it on hold because this much is enough. You can use principle of virtual work. You, you got a good introduction to principle of virtual work. Uh, how it can be used to arrive at equilibrium equation. Now we go to the next topic. We go to different types of structure. We look at beams. We look at uh, trusses. We look at frames. We look at cables. We look at arches one by one. So let's go straight to beams. What is a beam? How will you define a beam? A beam is a flexural member. What is a flexural member? What is flexure? A beam is a member in which the loads when applied in the transverse direction will cause the structure to bend. What is bending? You are right. Your answers are correct. What is bending? This is good enough. This is called right brain is saying well, this is bending. Straight thing and does like that bending. What in words what is that bending? When the section is taken. A section and all very difficult. Right brain tell me. Left brain is only taking section. Don't take sections. We can see a curvature. Ah, you can see that it is simple English. It is curved. Something was straight, now it is curved. You like curves? Yes. So, a measure of the curve is curvature. What is curvature? Mathematically. The reciprocal of the radius. Which is the ideal curve that everybody likes to draw? Circle. Circle see, wonderful. Circle has a radius. Yes. So, how will you define curvature once in terms of radius? Reciprocal, reciprocal of radius. Very good. 1 by r. What is the unit of curvature? Uh, meter, meter raised to minus 1. Meter raised to minus 1. Oh, 1 by meter. Got it? Never forget this. Whenever we talk of bending, we are talking of curvature. Because we are always thinking of not the full circle, a segment of a circle. Remember, the, the other thing is imagine. You don't need. Got it? Let me ask you, since you came this far, let me see. Let's take it one step further. Let's take a cantilever. And let me apply a concentrated load. And this is going to deflect like this. Agreed? Where is the curvature maximum? Okay, let me help you by saying this is A and this is B. Where is the curvature maximum? At A. At A, the curvature is maximum. Where is the bending moment maximum? At A. At A. Where is the curvature minimum? At B. What does minimum mean? What is the value of curvature at B? 
You can think of bending moment. What's the relationship between bending moment and curvature? You have to write. What is the relation between bending moment and curvature? Tell me M is equal in a linear elastic element. M is equal to? Okay. What is that? Just like you mugged up Newton's law and vomited it out. You vomit out simple bending theory equation which we've all learned by heart. What is it? M by I is equal to? Sigma by Y is equal to? You got a long equation, you can knock off one fellow and then tell, make it M by I e e equal to E by R. Will you all remember this? Now, connect M to 1 by R. 1 by R is curvature. So, M is equal to? Directly proportional to? Curvature. So, wherever you are strong in statics, that's why you quickly said moment is maximum, moment is zero. If moment is maximum, curvature is also maximum. A moment is zero, curvature is also zero. But physically, can you relate it to radius of curvature? To do that, in your mind, you should understand what the hell is going on. Where is curvature zero? At A or B? Moment is zero where? B. Curvature is? So, how can you prove to me visually that the Radius of curvature should be how much? If curvature is zero, radius of curvature should be? Radius of curvature is zero. So in your gate exam, we will not ask you what is curvature. We will ask you what is radius of curvature. Infinity, right? So how do you understand this? So it's like this. In your mind, draw circles. Radius of curvature. So here, for example, I can draw a, a, a circle like that, right? And this radius, 1 by r, is the curvature here. And will the ball become bigger or smaller as I go from A to B? It'll become bigger. Why? Because the bending moment diagram is linearly varying from a maximum value here. So I become bigger, bigger, bigger. Here when I reach B, the radius is going to be infinite. One way to understand that is, in your mind, you imagine there is an extension to this. Right? If you give an extension to that, that part will just go straight. And the bending moment there is zero. Right? So that's how. So you'll find that here you have a, in this region, you have a giant of a circle which you can hard, you, you can just imagine goes all the way to infinity. So the circle is becoming larger, larger, larger. Got it? You have, that's how you connect the right brain to the left brain. Normally who, no one bothers about curvature. So, I will end, I will take five more minutes by explaining what is curvature. Alright, so in this we have many topics, I will quickly go through them. This is such a simple subject we can, but still it is nice to go through the fundamentals once again. So, can you have strain without stress, actual strain? Without actual stress? Give an example. Thermal loading. You, ink, you know, you take an object and you raise the temperature and put it on a frictionless surface. It wants to increase in length, it will increase in length. So we call that thermal strain. But there is no stress. Similarly, give me an example of a beam where you have curvature but no bending moment. In this example, cantilever, can I have zero bending moment but still the same curve? What should I do to make the beam bend but have zero bending moment? So then I am taking a case where there is bending, there is curvature but no bending moment. I am paralyzing your left brain. 
because it needs to be paralyzed. One injection. How to make this happen? Just like the other example, axial strain. No, no, this can't leave a beam, you tell me. What can I do to get a change in curvature? It is straight. But I don't want any bending moment. Heat it. How? You have to heat it in a particular way. Why not do on both sides? You have some problem? Like an air conditioned room. Equally. I don't understand. What you need is a temperature gradient. Yes or no? So I, I'll show you how it can be done. So this is a beam. It's a cantilever. Uh, obviously, I wanted to bend up because uh, my space is here. Okay. So what I do is I give it a temperature gradient, like I've shown here. At the middle centroidal axis, temperature is zero. In the bottom, I'm going to increase the temperature linearly. Say I, all the way from plus 30 degrees delta n minus 30 degrees on top like in a freezer room or whatever, possible. Then what happens? I know that the top fiber wants to in, uh, change, reduce in length by L alpha t and the bottom fiber wants to increase in length by L alpha t, right? And nobody is stopping it from getting what it wants. There is no restraint. So what will happen? It will curl up. It will curl up and you can find out the this has the curved length is smaller than this by this quantity and this bottom curved length is more than this by this quantity got it common sense alpha is a coefficient of thermal expansion t is a change in temperature now the center line of this does not change in length it's neutral here is a case where Above the neutral axis, do you have compression? And below the neutral axis, tension? Bad words. Tension is usually a force. Compression is a force. So what's the correct word to say? You still have a neutral axis because the length is not changed. There's no strain there, thermal strain. So you should use better, you should use your correct words. Below the centroidal axis, what do you have? Elongation. Elongation. And above the centroid leg, what do you have? Contraction. So I'm saying, stop the left brain from talking too much. Use the right brain, right? So changes in length only we are talking about. So this got curled, curved up, and this is the radius of curvature. Can you tell me, a, give me a formula for this radius of curvature? That's all? Or curvature, one of the two formulas. Can you tell me, in terms of L alpha t? What is the formula for R? So they say, we did not study all this. This is not equilibrium. What are you teaching? I am teaching you to unlearn all that you learnt and learn like a baby fresh, if you are capable. Yes? So we will stop today's class with this homework. You will tell me, a formula for either R or 1 by R. 1 by R, the symbol for curvature is phi. And we will use that. Phi is equal to 1 by R. Okay. So we begin learning about bending by understanding bending. Bending is bending. Change in curvature. Not bending moment. Bending moment, nobody will understand. You tell your grandmother, Bending moment, she said, what are you talking about? You say, curve, okay, I understand. We are also like that. Don't think that by being an engineer, you understand bending. Nobody has understood bending moment. Everybody understands bending. Got it? Before we end, what's the difference between bending and buckling? Often in interviews, we find total confusion. What is buckling? What is buckling and how is it different from bending? Both start with B and end in ing. When force is applied in the longitudinal direction. 
You usually apply it like this or like this? Buckling, we begin with, uh, talk of in compression members column. Okay, you apply. Then? Then It will always buckle? Then? Speak in a clear way where I understand what you are saying. What is buckling? Give an example of buckling and bending. So in bending you are saying loads are always applied in the transverse direction and because you apply loads in a beam it will bend. And the more loads you apply the more it will bend. More it will bend means more the curvature, less the radius of curvature. And it's proportional. As bending moment increases, curvature will increase and the radius of curvature will inversely change. Got it? Now I said don't apply load in in uh, along in in the transverse, apply it in the longitudinal direction, in a column for example. Then what will happen? Then will it reduce in length? That's an actual, that's like a truss member, no? Compression member. Okay, so why, what is this? Will it bend? When there is an accident or eccentricity, huh? accident or eccentricity that will cause the... So you, you can't, if it's, there's no eccentricity, no buckling will Perfectly take place? Straight. Perfectly straight. Perfectly straight structure. So total confusion. If it's there's some eccentricity accidental, then it'll start bending. You're getting all mixed up. It's not buckling, it's bending. When your eccentricity brings bending, not buckling. Right from the word go, it'll start bending. Now buckling is something completely different. What is it? So usually, when you apply a vertical load in the axial direction, longitudinal direction, it will take only axial compression in an ideal column. But studies have shown that when that applied load reaches a critical load, patak, suddenly it will take a bent shape. Does that bent shape have a definite uh, radius of curvature? No, it will go on because that's your eigenvalue solution. Theoretically, it will increase to large deformation and fail. So something else is happening there. What is happening? It is the load at which the flexural stiffness becomes zero. It loses its flexural stiffness and so it, it buckles. Okay, that's a different topic. We'll come to that if time permits because we'll do second order analysis. You have to understand all that. But for the time being, we'll look at bending. We'll continue with this slide in the next class. But I want you to give me a formula in the next class. Two things you have to give me next class. What are the first thing? I forgot. Not definition of work. How to make sense of the fact that the physicists have a definition of work and it doesn't make sense to us in many practical cases. Second question is, complete this and give me a formula for R in terms of whatever you can see here. L alpha T, A, A is also there, whatever you want. Okay. What is, you already did it. What's the answer? A by L alpha T. I don't know. Check it out. A by L alpha T. A by? A by alpha T. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so you have multiple solutions. We don't know. Maybe I should take the strain energy of all of you and see which is will. Okay. Check it out. Thank you. Bye.